Hello, everyone. Welcome to this uh, webinar. My name is Miriam Birubi, and I am working with uh, Tamarac. I work for Quebec and the, commu and the Francophone communities. I will be your uh, MC today for this webinar, this webinar called From ID to Impact, the Civic Incub Incubator at the Maison de l'Innovation Sociale. So first of all, I would like to thank our partner, the Secretariat aux Relations Canadiennes, uh, the Secretariat is our main partner, and it's thanks to the Secretariat that interpretation into English is available today. So we begin this workshop by acknowledging uh, today that uh, I'm speaking from you from Jojagi, which is uh, commonly known as Montreal. Uh, it is on the unceded territory of the Ganihaga. And historically, this was a place of gathering for many First Nations. Uh, so this is a very significant area region for many First Nations. Uh, and this uh, land acknowledgement today, I would like to sh to think of all of the generations who have taken care of this land throughout the many centuries. Uh, and this uh, acknowledgement is particularly interest in important, given that we will soon uh, be with. Uh, we will soon uh, actually have the uh, Truth and Reconciliation Day on September 30th. Uh, there are a number of activities that are organized in a number of areas to commemorate this day. So please uh, ask questions about what's happening near you and participate. Uh, September 30th is a really important day. The day marks the incredible tragic events uh, that we are all aware of uh, with respect to the Indigenous uh, schools and the missing the missing children and families. So it's really an opportunity to think and to be, to express our solidarity with the Indigenous organizations. I see that uh, some of the participants have already indicated in the um, special panel to that effect, the areas and the regions that they come from, namely the uh, land acknowledgements. Uh, so after this uh, moment of uh, gratitude and land acknowledgement, I still would like to be able to introduce you to the Tamarack Institute for those of you who may know may not know us as well. Uh, so at the center of what we do, we actually work on five interrelated practices that for us can really provide the resources to change makers who are working in communities. Uh, so evaluating impact, collective impact, community engagement, collaborative leadership and community innovation. Uh, so we offer a number of training, uh, courses, uh, publications as well, and they all address one or many parts of those uh, activities. Uh, we also support uh, our vibrant communities, and this is basically a broad range of uh, organizations and initiatives that aim to reduce poverty, to strengthen the social fabric, to build youth futures, and ensure a just and equitable climate transition. So if you'd like to know more about what we're doing, whether it has to do with our training, our learning activities, uh, or as well to see what we're doing with respect to our network of vibrant communities, uh, then please contact us. And now I'm very happy to introduce our panelists today. So today we have with us uh, Philippe Arisin uh, from the project Épicerie Edugente. Uh, this is one of the first uh, project that we have, Jola Côté. Her project is called Couleur d'Enfant, Sarah Abarro, who is a coordinator of the um, incubation programs, and Hugo Steben, who is the director of capacity building and incubation, also with the Maison de l'Innovation Sociale, the MIS. Uh, so actually, now that I've introduced everyone, perhaps I'd ask uh, Hugo to say a bit a few words about you and also regarding the Maison de l'Innovation Sociale, the MIS. Thank you. Hello, every Hello everyone. So Hugo Steven, uh, I'm responsible for training, coaching, etc. And today I'm actually the 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 oldest member of this organization. I've been working here for over six years. Uh, so our organization is a non-for-profit organization that was set up in 2017. Uh, our goal is to reduce the obstacles uh, that uh, can exist between people thinking about an innovation 
a project and to be able to to implement it. So really what we want to do is to be able to support uh, the change makers uh, who have uh, ideas regarding projects. Yes, welcome Hugo, thank you very much. Uh, and Sarah, would you like to say a few words uh, about your work uh, before we move on to our other panelists today? Yes, uh, first of all, I'd like to say that I'm very happy to be with you today. Uh, the, to talk about a civic incubator projects. Uh, and that's what I do on my day-to-day -day projects. I've been working with this organization for the last two and a half years, and I'm namely responsible for the civic incubator project, uh, and I coordinate those projects. So that's what I do. Great. Thank you, Sarah, says Miriam. Uh, so, Jolette, would you like to say a few words about yourself uh, and to speak to us about your project, Couleur d'Enfant? Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Jolette Côté. I'm the project coordinator at Couleur d'Aventance. So this is a not-for-profit not organization that aims actually to work with respect to, to work with educational child care services in Quebec and NPOs and private companies and to work uh, on uh, ethnocultural diversity and special needs and educational activities. Uh, Thank you, Jolette, a great project. I'm looking forward to hearing more about that. Uh, so Philippe, would you like to speak to us about your project called the uh, Epicerie Intelligente? Uh, hello everyone, my name is Philippe, uh, um, Philippe Harrison, and I am a specialized educator. And my incubator project, I worked on it with my colleague, my colleague Virginie Denomé, who is a guidance counselor. And we looked at access integration and keeping young people uh, employed, uh, specifically uh, youth that have a physical disability. And here I'm talking about uh, entry level uh, positions, entry level jobs. Uh, these can be particularly difficult for that tranche of the population. So what we're trying to do with our project uh, is to make the workplaces more accessible, but also more um, compassionate. Thank you. Thank you, Philippe. I'm looking forward to hearing more about that. Uh, so, Hugo, I'd like to come back to you. Why don't we start with you? Why don't you speak to us a bit about uh, the Civic Incubator? To what extent does that program meet the community's needs? Uh, if you look, if we look together rather at a bigger, a, a bigger picture. So what was happening was that there were a number of projects that were happening. And, and we were working with organizations that were looking for innovative approaches to be able to uh, find solutions. So they had a lot of ideas, but they didn't have solutions. But on the other hand, uh, we felt that there was a lot of initiative, a lot of energy, a lot of people who wanted to start doing something to try to design projects. Uh, but basically they were falling in what we coin as the valley of death. Uh, so sometimes there could be some blind spots uh, by the organizations. They didn't have uh, the resources. And a number of people had this uh, feeling of being an imposter. So what we saw is that oftentimes that energy didn't go anywhere before the project was actually able to start up. Uh, so this is a program that basically helps uh, uh, individuals, organizations, and small NPOs uh, to be able to launch uh, pilot projects, pilot projects in the area of social innovation. Uh, what we do is that we help, we help organizations at the beginning of their ideas, of their projects, uh, so what we want is that uh, projects will have a lot of impact. Uh, and sometimes we can take decisions that will have an impact uh, three or four years later. But also it's at that point that uh, people who are thinking about doing something, who want to move forward and implement a social innovation project, uh, well, ironically, that's, at, that's the point where the project is so critical because that's where there are little or no support resources. So that's where we step in. So to be able to uh, to come out of the valley of 
death. Uh, that's quite a metaphor. That's quite a metaphor. Thank you, Hugo. That was very clear. And thank you for launching that. Uh, and now, Sarah, over to you. Perhaps you could explain to us uh, what does this process look like? Uh, and perhaps you could speak to us uh, about a couple of uh, learnings, because I know that this isn't the first time that you have been working on incubator projects. Uh, well, I want to come back to the first question uh, with respect to how the Civic Incubator Project works. Uh, the program exists since 2018. Uh, and actually, this is our seventh cohort that will be beginning in January. So we work with 20 teams from January to September, and we work with them for seven hours a week and in a hybrid mode. Uh, so mainly people are online and that way we're able to adapt to people's various schedules, but also to make it easier for people to participate. We also have a number of activities in person throughout that period so that we're able to focus on specific areas. We also want to help participants to better know each other and to develop a team spirit. So that's a bit how things happen. And also we're working on two areas. First of all, we're working on project, projects by change makers, uh, but also we work with the uh, people. Hugo was talking about transformation. So we work with people on that front as well. Uh, with respect to the project, uh, we really want to look at an idea and try to establish that that idea really meets a a, a need in a community. And we will be assessing that throughout the process uh, until we reach the planning phase. And then it's a little more, it's a little clearer, what are the various stages, what resources will I need, et cetera, so that we can actually launch the project. Uh, so that's the project side of thing. Uh, so it, let's now talk about the people. We, you know, leading projects, especially especially uh, impact projects that can be quite complex. Uh, it's not always easy. So sometimes there are barriers uh, and there are issues that we were faced with. There are a lot of emotions that are attached with that as well. So what we want to do here is to see how we can work with uh, people so that they have a little more psychological flexibility so that uh, so that people can work through sort of gray areas, how people can cooperate with other people on the project. So these are all the steps that we undertake, that we work through with people so that the uh, change makers are able to actually bring their project to fruition. And uh, so in that sense, you provide coaching, et cetera, don't you? Yes. Uh, I was uh, able to be a mentor on one occasion. And so maybe you'd like to speak uh, a bit about how you go get uh, various people with various expertise. Uh, yes, I forgot to speak about that, says Sarah. The way that we work throughout the process is that there is training. There are also other opportunities for the various teams to exchange, uh, but there are also people who come and work with uh, the people who are responsible for the project, uh, as you mentioned, Mariam, uh, but also there's individual coaching and there's work time as well, work that needs to be done with respect to exploration and also work that needs to be done on the ground. Uh, so this is how we work with the various stakeholders as well. In fact, we work with coaches that work with the teams throughout all of the process, but we also have uh, the opportunity to have external people who might be specialists in a particular area and that could be helpful to the project. So what we want is to be able to have some people come in to challenge people, challenge projects, to see where all the blind spots are and to be able to examine specific issues and specific themes. Uh, so we're trying to integrate the experience of a number of people into the process. Uh, that's a very dynamic approach, uh, Sarah. Thank you very much for explaining that. Uh, and now I'm very interested in hearing about uh, 
the uh, people who have actually gone through this process. Uh, so, uh, Philippe and Jolette, uh, would you like to speak to us about uh, what your experience was with respect to the process and what was particularly, what are the main takeaways from that? Uh, I can start, says Jolette, uh, and my project, Couleur d'enfant, came, came forward uh, after after that I was thinking about a social innovation project. But my this idea, I'd been thinking about it for 14 years uh, because I was working with young children at the time. Uh, so that idea, I it came to mind 14 years ago when I was working with young children. Uh, so I realized that we didn't have a lot of information for first and second generation uh, uh, Canadians. So it was important for me to ensure that uh, education, that educational child care services and those who work there would have uh, some background in that to try to eliminate discrimination and bias. Uh, and so that went forward and it became a bit of an obsession for me over the last 14 years, but I didn't know where to start. I didn't know who to ask for help and how to launch the idea and how to develop that idea actually. So in the end, uh, I, I found out about the Civic Incubator. I wrote to them. I spoke to them about my project. Uh, and thankfully for me, I was a part of the projects that were, that were approved in 2020. And you know what? I was extremely challenged throughout all of the process. It's very interesting. We're asked to think all the time, all the time. We're looking for blind spots. Uh, and uh, we're in contact with various stakeholders and we're really called upon to deepen our thinking about the project. Uh, and for my sake, it allowed me to really better, pro better prepare the project, uh, better prepare my project, which is called Couleur d'Enfant. So it was very challenging to go through this process and it was very enriching as well. Uh, so yes, I can understand uh, that can take you out of your zone of comfort as well so that you're able to look at your ideas and to ensure that you're able to go from the ideation stage uh, to the implementation. And Philip, what about you? So technically I'm part of the, the, the a group of projects that are still underway, that is still underway, 2023. And it's a bit like Jolette, uh, there were ideas, that came to us. It's something that I was thinking about for a long time. Uh, and it's a bit of a passion for me. I had this idea in the back of my head. Uh, and for Virginie, my colleague and I, we wanted to move forward. And when we spoke about the civic incubators, uh, we were, we, you know, we were a little doubtful. We were wondering, you know what, are we going to be losing our time because uh, there was the issue of having to work on that seven hours a week. And we said, oh, you know, project management, uh, we're familiar with that. Uh, but we needed somebody, you know, what to tell us how to do a business plan. So worst case scenario, we'll learn how to do that. We were completely wrong. The There was the emotional and the cognitive experience and Sarah and Jolette spoke about that. We really live that. And one of the things that really struck us is the extent to which uh, social innovation is very different from an entrepreneurship, you know, typical entrepreneurship. When we talk about entrepreneur, entrepreneurship, there are a lot of terms like uh, business plans, uh, competition, markets. But when we talk about social innovation, uh, we don't want to set up in a in a empty office. Uh, rather, we want to be able to set up in an ecosystem. We're part of a community. We're part of an environment, um, and there are a lot of stakeholders who are involved. Uh, and when we launch that type of project for social innovation, what we want are impacts. We want change. We look to change the world in a positive way. So really have to think about that. Uh, we also have to take into account all of those factors. So it's that process that really uh, had an impact on us. Uh, and because we 
are inserting ourselves in an ecosystem where we were able to develop a really good network within our community. For example, we were able to contact people. There were people who came into our project as well, or we were able to work with the other project leaders in other incubator projects. And sometimes there are projects that actually have an intersection. So this is very uh, positive. This is a very positive aspect of our experience. So you're really enriching the existing ecosystem. You spoke a bit about the impact. So when people get involved in these types of projects, it's because people are ready to move to action. People want to see the benefits of our projects. So, so could you speak to us a bit about that? What are the uh, the concrete uh, the concrete uh, results? Uh, what were the first results that you saw? What are some of the accomplishments that you're proud of? And what are some of the challenges as well that you faced during the project? Uh, and also for the Maison d'Innovation Sociale, for Hugo and Sarah, if you would like to speak about uh, what your experience is with some of the projects, so that we can have a bit of an idea of what are the concrete uh, outcomes. This is Jolette. So on the ground, on my project, the first year, we wanted we wanted to have a visibility for our organization. We wanted to explain why that strategy was important for the um, for the organizations. And here we received we began to receive a lot of contact uh, for from a number of specialized um, for uh, rather um, children's educators. So, and in fact, uh, that opened a lot of doors and allowed us to have a lot of visibility because uh, the project really helped us reach uh, other, other educational childcare services. Uh, but also we were able to have a visibility with some companies, with various municipalities. Uh, so it, it actually, uh, reached a number of clients that I never even thought that would be of interest to them because uh, I was really concentrated on educational child care services. Uh, so I realized that we were really responding to a need in the market. Uh, and it's a need that's much greater than what I had thought would exist in creating this project. Those are really great results. Uh, when when the project actually meets a demand, it's great. And Philippe, what can you tell us about? For us, uh, the project is pretty recent. Uh, so throughout the incubator uh, process, uh, we spoke a lot about uh, hypotheses. And right now what we're doing is we're validating these hypotheses. So we're working on a pilot project. Uh, we have uh, three young people who are living with a physical disability and they're gonna come and work with us for a three month period. And I will be working with them as a specialized educator and also by uh, Virginie, who is a guidance counselor. So we're be, we, what we want to do is to create a learning um, opportunity for them. And subsequent to that, we will be able to decide what our project will look like. Will we be working with existing existing grocery stores or will we launch our own grocery store? One of the results that I wasn't expecting is now when I speak about this idea, not only with the uh, people around me, but within my network, my friends, et cetera, then people are taking more seriously. Whereas at the beginning, you know, uh, basically people might have thought that, yeah, well, this is just basically an idea that was created on the back of an envelope. But now when we come forward with idea, it's clear that we thought about it, that we've done our work. So at the beginning, 
uh, it might have seemed that this project was a little light, but now people are paying attention to it. Uh, and we see that there are doors that are opening up around us. And I think that that's something that we would never have believed possible. But for us, these are results that are really concrete because we see the opportunity of transforming these uh, situations on the ground. Uh, so how do you explain that? How do you explain what happened? Uh, <laughs> I think it's a bit of the, a mix of uh, both of those things. So first of all, to get rid of our uh, impression that we're imposters. Uh, specifically, you know, when you work in the social area, people ask themselves, well, why me? Why would I be the one to change the world? Uh, but also, on a personal level, it was important. But And with respect to the project, uh, you know, we were able to confirm our ideas on the ground. We have a plan, a plan that's concrete, that's practical. And I think that the support that we received uh, from the incubator project, uh, well, both of those uh, si both of those things were important in order for us to be heard. Thank you. Ugu. Would you like to add something with respect to results, either on those projects or other projects that you have worked on or with? Perhaps we could talk about the results of the program from the beginning with the group of projects that are coming forward. Well, we'll be able to talk about 100 projects in Montreal since 2018. That represents about a hundred and fifty project leaders that we will have worked with throughout the uh, life of the project. And since 2018, there are 70% of the projects that are still active, whereas in entrepreneurship, traditional entrepreneurship, uh, we wouldn't have seen that level of success. Uh, so, and here we're talking about uh, social innovation. So that's really great. And also over the last year, we've seen statistics uh, statistics of uh, project leaders. Uh, and what we see is that 100% of the project leaders have had a positive impact uh, on, the, on how clear the project is, on their confidence in their ability to lead the project, but also the resilience, the re resilience when they meet barriers along the way. So we were talking about the projects, that's one thing, but oftentimes well, at the for the uh, civic incubator projects, we're helping people. So beyond the projects, it's important to invest in the change makers. These are people who beyond that project will influence other projects, will contribute to other projects. Uh, we've seen people who have changed career paths uh, and there are a couple uh, of the project leaders who went who are now municipal elected officials, some went back to school in a completely different area of study. And there's also an impact on the risks. You know, if, oh, the, the narrative says, the narrative actually is that it's possible to move forward and the projects are inspirational. And sometimes, uh, the average person might have an idea, but it allows them to think about what can be done. Uh, so it's basically the uh, snowball effect. Uh, the snowball effect, the impact that these projects will have an impact uh, and also how the project leaders will have an impact uh, on a broader scale. Thank you, Sarah. Would you like to add something? No. I know I could speak to you about a lot of projects. I could tell you where they're at at this point, uh, but I don't know if we'd have time for that. Uh, yes, from an assessment perspective, it's really interesting that you were able to document all the work that was done and the experience of the uh, project uh, leaders. Uh, yes, yes, and, and you know what? We spoke about the uh, people who were involved in these incubator projects. Uh, and they told us what the impacts were. 
In fact, if you want to go have a look on our website, all of the projects that we've been involved with since the beginning are there. You can find articles, videos, interviews uh, with a vast number of people who have gone through this process. Uh, so it's always very fascinating and uh, inspiring, actually, to look at those people's stories. It's very uh, motivational. You know, it's possible to change the world, and that's part of the impact that we want to have. I also want to add that there are projects in a vast number of areas. Uh, we want actually the program to be very diversified. For example, some projects uh, uh, are, are more um, targeting uh, individual needs, uh, other projects that target inclusion. There are projects that are targeted towards uh, social fabric, how communicate how communities are stronger together, the whole issue of collective action, and also how the communities uh, uh, live with respect to their ecosystem, the natural environment, et cetera. So there's that whole aspect of things that's uh, of interest as well. Yes, it's very interesting for you to talk about diversity. It's interesting that you're working with the project leaders who have different ideas, who have different projects and all of the collaboration that can take place uh, in that type of context. Uh, so that diversity of project is quite interesting. Uh, you go. Yes, at that step of the uh, project, we're trying to increase the potential. So we want to have a diversity of people there are people who are involved in research and want to have an impact, uh, people who are working on the ground and want to have another type of impact, uh, as well the uh, activists who want to have a complementary impact, uh, also people who were living within communities that, were, that they're looking to change. Uh, so to try to talk about those different points of view, et cetera, that can have an impact. Uh, but also the notion of being in contact with people who are working in a wide variety of projects, very diverse projects. Uh, so people, for example, who are interested in a specific area will be inclined to work on that project. But there are people, for example, who are, might be working in affordable housing who might see that there are complementary interests with other projects. Um, so we are not a business incubator. What we want are citizenship movements. Uh, we want incubators for events and projects. Sometimes projects can become businesses, uh, but that's not what we're looking to uh, have as an outcome. We don't tell people, yes, the end goal should be a business. Uh, what we want is a diversity of projects. Uh, that's very interesting. Uh, so I see that there are a number of questions popping up in the uh, webinar chat section. So before we go around the table again, I'd like to speak to you about the challenges. Uh, so as part of social innovation, Ego spoke about the valley of death. Uh, so that's one challenge uh, to be able to go from the valley of death uh, to action, but once the projects are, are in the process of being implemented, I gather that there are a number of other challenges that you have to overcome. So Jalen and Philippe, what are the main challenges that you've seen in uh, social innovation? The main challenge is that we, we have to begin with a solution, a solution that is more or less defined. Uh, but we always have to start with thinking about what is the desired outcome. And sometimes we have to deconstruct the basic idea that we had at the beginning to look at alternatives, to think that it's possible to have an impact by an action that we hadn't foreseen from the beginning. Maybe we need to go get different actors, different actors that would allow us to bring our idea much further. But 
we start with a solution that's a bit like our baby, but it requires a lot of humility. And I would really say sort of a roller coaster of emotions as well. Uh, and thankfully, the coaches are there and the other project leaders are there as well. Uh, but that is uh, certainly one of the biggest challenges uh, uh, for the vast majority of us. And Gillette, what about you? Yes, I'd like to add the fear to the, the, the fear of change uh, because as project leaders, we have to change ourselves uh, because we're speaking to various people who have different realities and their experience can be different can be different from what we were imagining at the beginning of the project uh, because uh, we have an idea and we develop it throughout the process for the civic incubator project. Uh, and in that work, we will be meeting a number of different people. It's very enriching. Various people have different experience. Uh, and as project leaders, it leads us to think about uh, the projects and how we can adapt it. Uh, so that could create a certain uh, feeling of fear. And also, when we're working on a new project, we can be a little uh, reticent with respect to various stakeholders. Uh, so I would say that that is my barrier, what I saw throughout the development of the project. Uh, but you know, when you go through the process uh, and when we're able to accept ourselves and accept ourselves in the context of developing our project, it's really gratifying and it's really enriching as well. So it's really to overcome the fear that we may have, but also the fear that the people who are working with us may have. Uh, so yes, you're talking about transformation, not only transformation through action, but also your personal and professional transformation that you're going through in order to be able to bring this project to life. Uh, thank you, Jolette. Uh, thank you, Philippe. Uh, and perhaps uh, we can change the scenario so that we can keep our, our round table for the end of our meeting, because I see that there are a number of uh, questions uh, that are being asked. So for those who are us, those of you who are listening to us, if you have questions, you know, all the questions are good. All of your questions are welcome with respect to Civic Incubator Project uh, on specific projects that were spoken about here as well. So a first question was on the role of the municipality. So does the city play a role in the civic incubator program? Uh, and also, is this only offered in Montreal uh, or are there other cities in Quebec or elsewhere that the uh, civic incubator program exists? Uh, the city actually plays a number of different roles. Uh, first of all, this is a free program because there are change makers in the ecosystem think like we do, that the people who have the best ideas don't necessarily have the resources. So they would like to thank uh, the city and a various number of other foundations for their support. Uh, the city of Montreal, uh, apart from providing funding, well, there are a number of uh, municipal services uh, are called upon to help us uh, at the beginning of the projects. There are people from the city that will play a role. They will be able to provide their points of view throughout the process of the project. Uh, so in this case, we're talking about external actors who are able to uh, provide guidance. Uh, so generally, there is somebody from the city who will be working with us in selecting the projects. Uh, representatives from the city will also intervene on a various on a variety of subjects, but also in this case, we're talking about pro projects that run from January to September. But once the project is, that period is over, the project is not over because we'll continue to support, we'll continue to support people in their projects. I was speaking to Jolette about this uh, last week and we have allies in the city who help us to open doors 
to open doors for the project leaders. Uh, sometimes it's easier to have the help from the inside rather than from the outside. With respect to Montreal, the Civic Incubator Project is currently the subject of discussion. First of all, we've just renewed our association with the City of Montreal for the next three years, but we are speaking with a number of people in other regions to see how we can replicate the Civic Incubator Program uh, and also the, the, approach, the notion of uh, incubator has been replicated in other areas as well. So what we want to be able to do is to consolidate the support that we're providing in a specific region. And I have some thinking about get to know. So yes, uh, so I saw the questions and answers. There are people who have questions about the Gaspé Z, the Gaspé region, Gatno, and other regions of Quebec. So I, what Hugo was saying, uh, I know that the goal of the Maison d'Innovation Sociale is not necessarily to be involved in all regions, but rather to be able to transfer the skills and competencies to other regions. One other thing. So part of this program. Okay, so the whole notion of the program, certain portions, certain thinking associated with the program can actually be used by other organizations. You can go on our website, uh, we have tools, there are capsules, uh, all of the information there can be used uh, free of charge. Our goal is to be able to go beyond uh, our program. But there is so much need and there's so much enthusiasm so we're always looking looking at ways to go beyond and further. Yes, and I see that Jamie added some information on the webinar chat, uh, the link to your website uh, for those of you who are interested in uh, discovering your resources. Uh, earlier ago, you spoke about the various partners, uh, the various uh, foundations, et cetera, that are providing funding support. Uh, so one of the questions is associated with that. Uh, so are your services free of charge? Uh, and uh, if not, uh, what is the financial contribution that you were asking? So Sarah or Hugo, could you respond to that, please? Very quickly, contribution. So participating in the program, it's free. But there a number of other things that we would like to do, and that's discussed on a case-by-case -case, uh, basis. We're a not-for-profit organization, so there's a limit to the types of things that we can do. That being said, we're very proactive. We want to be able to work with people to provide the funding to, for the various projects that we're involved in. Another question with respect to the budget. So on average, what is the budget for the uh, projects that are accepted as part of the Civic Incubator Program? Uh, so this is a question for everyone, actually. Uh, this is Sarah. The short answer is, there's no answer to your question. Why? Well, it's because first of all, what we want is to provide a proper structure for the solution. At the beginning of the program, uh, we ask people to forget, to forget the project completely, to focus rather on the solution that we're trying to reach. Uh, so we want to be able to deconstruct a solution at the beginning of the project to see what can be done with it. And then we look at the budget. So the answer could be a lot. Uh, or less, uh, it really depends on where you are in your thinking. There's no good or bad answer to that question. When people file projects, we don't ask them what their budget, budget is, et cetera. We do talk about the financial scenario scenarios throughout the process, but generally at the end of the process, uh, 
there's no expectation that there will be a budget. Oftentimes, there's still work that needs to be done, uh, and some teams will want to work on that alone with a specialist or with us, because sometimes it can be difficult to get that level of information, but sometimes the scale approaches can be very big. So there's a project, uh, there's a project for 70 housing units near the Canal La Chine, uh, so that's a bigger project. Uh, so. What I want to say is that the budget is not a criteria to be accepted as part of the program, nor an end result that's expected. Also, when we are talking about the diversity of projects, well, you know what? All the answers are good on that front. Thank you. I see that there's interest in the webinar chat as well, that uh, people are interested in, in seeing what's possible to do outside of Quebec. Uh, and Marie-Noël has a question. Uh, how, how do you manage the work that you do with the project incubators at the political level, whether it be at the municipal, provincial, or national level? So I can uh, jump in here, says Sarah. I think that one of the answers is to say that, first of all, that we look at the problem that we're trying to resolve, and then we look at the various steps, the steps that could lead us to a, a, a system-wide impact, either in a neighborhood, a city, in a various region, even at the national level. So from that perspective, oftentimes uh, we'll, we'll try to have a first project. Philip was speaking about a pilot project earlier. So what is the size of a pilot project that would allow me to have an impact so that I can move on to the next step? And I, as Hugo was mentioning, we continue to work with project uh, beyond the process as well. Uh, so there are results that we see the projects uh, grow. And oftentimes that's when we're able to create relationships either with somebody from the city or other stakeholders. So that's a bit of how we work. Uh, I don't know if anybody would like to add something. I think that really illustrates uh, what's the minimum viable project and how that can grow as well. Uh, but in Marie-Noël, uh, I, I think what she was looking for were comments on the political influence that can be had and how we help people with that. Uh, so if we want to change the system and if we want to uh, change policies, uh, other, other types of coaching that you provide on that front, sometime from the beginning, is that there's one area that speaks to the reality of the various actors in the public sector. One of the reasons why people have trouble making uh, contact with the public sector is that they don't know how the public sector works. So how do things work uh, such that people are able to knock at the right door with the right message, et cetera? and that they're able then to provide some influ to obtain uh, uh, people who will support them in influencing the visibility of their project. Uh, also, when we talk about the wide variety of projects, we have developed a lot of contacts and a lot of ecosystems, and that allows us to open a lot of doors. So, so that's work that we're able to do when the projects become uh, more mature, so we're able to speak to people in the community sector and the public sector. So we're able to create those types of relationships, but also in a number of discussions that we have uh, with various partners. Uh, for example, we have a strategic coaching team that's available. There's also the innovation lab laboratory that we can work with. Uh, so we're able to refer some of the projects uh, to uh, various organizations that are working in that field on the ground, but that there's also a lot of visibility that's available for the projects, whether that's um, capsules, uh, videos, et cetera. So there's a lot of work that we're able to do as well with respect to the visibility of the projects.
So a number of questions, and I'm going to ask them very quickly because they're, for example, questions about do you have partnership with uh, uh, public health, health organizations, uh, community organizations, uh, the Innovation Lab in Montreal, the SMB Montreal. So those are the partners that I see that were mentioned in the chat. Uh, uh, so my short answer is yes, yes. So you create uh, networks with the social innovation organizations, the community organizations, and we saw that as well with respect to uh, Jolette and Philippe's uh, projects. Uh, but we also know that uh, you spoke a lot about the demand, Jolette, the demand that was created with your project. Uh, and also with Philip's project, uh, Philip's project that aims to help uh, young people with physical disabilities. So I know that that would have an impact, for example, on the healthcare sector. So I gather that you work with a number of different partners uh, and that you're able to work as well with stakeholders that can help you provide more visibility to your projects. Yes. We have networks in various sectors, in various areas, and we do have very strong relationships there. But one of the things as well throughout the process is, is how we help the uh, project leaders to develop the confidence that they need to develop as well the networks and the relationships that the leaders, that the project leaders need in order to help their project grow and develop. You know? You, you know, there's that old image of you can either provide somebody with a fish or teach them how to fish. So we work on both fronts in our program because we are taught how to fish, but at the same time, we're able to feed people. So actually, we're, we're, very, uh, we're very lucky. So perhaps a last round table, and I see that there are other questions that are being asked in the webinar chat. And people can easily find responses, uh, either comments with respect to the next group of projects that are upcoming, but also if there are any questions with respect to the Maison d'Innovation Sociale. So uh, Sarah and Hugo, if people have questions with respect to the incubator program, they can contact you. This is Sarah. Yes, actually, you will find my email address. Uh, easily, but I will put it in the chat section. Uh, so if you have any questions uh, following the webinar, don't hesitate to contact uh, Sarah. And uh, finally, just a quick last round table. Uh, so can you talk about uh, one of your hopes for the future or some advice that you would like to provide to those who are listening to us? Uh, somebody who's thinking, oh, I have a project and I have an idea, but I don't dare move forward. So Jolette, perhaps we could start with you. For, for the future project leaders, if you have an idea, well, just go for it. Just go for it. Don't be scared. Go forward with your idea. Make it real. And put forward, put forward your aspirations. Uh, go get the help that you need, the coaching that you need. And a civic incubator project is an excellent opportunity to develop one's confidence as well. Uh, so here's my advice. Just go for it. Dive in. And Philippe, I was going to say the same thing. Go for it. Go, go, go. One of the things that helped me to get over the imposter syndrome is that I owed it to myself to bring this idea to fruition. And it's really, really worth it. Life is too short to not be passionate. So go, go, go. Thank you, Philippe. Hugo? I almost use always the same quote. You should never be surprised that a small 
group of people can change the world. We are able to bring change. And that's fundamental. It's fundamental to remember that. Also, coming back on what Philippe and Gillette said, is that uh, the barriers won't kill you. But to not move forward, that may be what you're going to be left with. You might, you might not succeed, but at least you will be able to feel that you tried to bring that idea to fruition, to go to the end of it. I agree with uh, what the group said. Uh, if you feel that you have a spark, a spash about an idea that you have, uh, if you feel that you have uh, uh, some intuitive idea that could have an impact, go for it because you are enough. All of the actors, all of the entrepreneurs, all the people you admire started out with asking themselves those questions. They had doubts, so they, they lived with the imposter syndrome. So trust yourself. So if you're motivated, if you're willing to be challenged on your idea, and if you want to simply uh, work with us, you're in the right place. So please move forward, put forward a project. If you think that this is a program that's made for you, Every year, there, the people who were chosen and the people who weren't chosen told us that that process helped them to actually move forward with their idea. We designed the selection process so that it would be useful for you and not only for us. We want it to be a process that's useful for you to be able to consolidate, to build your project. So if you are motivated, uh, put forward your project uh, and the deadline is October 29th uh, and if you have any doubts uh, then we invite you to put forward your projects right now because the 15 first projects that will be filed will be entitled to a number of hours of coaching so move forward put forward your project as soon as possible if you're interested in that uh, and I'd be really happy to speak to you about it Thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you for that great invitation. So before we go, I would like to thank all of you very warmly. Thank you for your generosity, Jolette and Philippe, for having spoke, spoken to us about your project. Uh, uh, good luck with your next projects. Thank you, Sarah and Hugo. It's always a pleasure to work with you. A bit of a quick announcement. I forgot to say that this webinar is a series of five webinars uh, on inspirational experience, uh, uh, inspiring experiences. Uh, so the next webinar will take place on October 25th, and it's on the evaluation of Montréal en commun, collaborating to generate learning in an urban innovation context. Uh, so we'll see you. October 25th at one o'clock and the registration is open and the link is in the webinar chat. Thank you to everyone. Thank you for being with us today, for your questions, for your interest. And I hope that today you're leaving us inspired and that you want to move forward and act. Have a great day, everyone.